Okay, we are now live on Facebook. So let me again say my name is Daryl Bonass. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Marine Mammal Science. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our December webinar. Um, this is part of the Editor's Select Seminar Series. And uh, presentations for the, the, this series come from publications in Marine Mammal Science. Um, before I introduce our speaker, uh, let me just remind everybody we will be recording this, um, and uh, that recording will be available. So if you know people who weren't able to tune in but would like to hear it, uh, they can uh, find a link to it on the uh, SMM um, website. If you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A anytime um, or after the presentation. Uh, don't put them in the chat, although if you forget that and do, we'll pay attention and uh, transfer them over to the Q&A section. So uh, with that, let me uh, introduce our speaker. Our speaker today actually could be morning, afternoon, or evening, since uh, three of us on here span that time frame. Um, but today, our speaker is Crystal Radke. Crystal um, has completed an honors degree and a master's degree at the University of New Brunswick. Um, she has worked in, on Weddell seals in the Antarctic, and the work she's going to talk about today um, is on narwhals in the Arctic. Um, interestingly, she's also worked um, uh, volunteer work in Bimini, so she's not um, only willing to work in cold climates. Uh, she's also uh, done volunteer work for the Dolphin Communication Project and for in, in Florida and Operation Wallacey in the UK. Her, her presentation, um, as you see the title there, I won't repeat it, and her uh, co-authors there, is based on her paper in Marine Mammal Science that was published um, and released in the October issue, and it is available um, and as open access, so it's available anytime by anyone. You don't have to be a member of the society to see it. So with that, I will turn it over to Crystal and uh, let her tell us what she's going to tell us. Crystal, it's all yours. Thanks, Daryl. Um, so I'm going to be talking about narwhal calling rate changes in association with passing ships in Malin Inlet, Nunavut, Canada. So this project was done as part of a um, environmental consultation. So there was also visual behavioral studies that were done, as well as all of the vocal, the vocal call counts that I did. So narwhals are a migratory species and they live in the Arctic, in anywhere from Northern Canada to Northern Russia. Um, and the, there are 12 subpopulations of them. And the subpopulation that I focus on is in this black circle and it is Eclipse Sound. And that subpopulation is listed as a species of least concern by the International Union of Conservation of, of Nature. Um, and in Canada, we have our own, that's called the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And we list them as a special concern specifically for that Eclipse Sound subpopulation. So narwhals are a small Arctic species. They're gray and they gain spots as they age. So in this photo, the, the smaller one is a juvenile and it's almost entirely gray. And then the larger one is an adult and it has a lot more spots on it. Um, the males typically have one tusk and they are typically one and a half times bigger than the females are. They're also a deep diving cetacean and this is because they eat pelagic fish and squid. They're also very social animals and they travel in pods, uh, which can range from anywhere from 20 individuals. And then those can all group up into several hundred individuals as they travel. So we know that it, it is known that when you have increases in shipping, it can lead to increases in sound pollution. And 
There are studies done that show that narwhals will move away from ships when they're exposed to noise. And this means that they show behavioral avoidance patterns. And that means that they'll hide along ice edges and shorelines. There's also studies done that show that marine mammals will change their vocal behaviors when they're around noise. And one of these examples are belugas and they'll change their calling rates within five kilometers of a ship. But we don't actually know how a narwhal's vocal responses occur when shipping noises around. When you want to look at the perceived sounds of what the animal you're looking at is, um, it's important to note that marine mammal groups all hear very differently. And so this means that a bowhead whale will not hear the same way that a narwhal hear, hears, which won't hear the same way as a porpoise. And to account for that, we do we use um, hearing curves to adjust for those levels that are perceived by the individual animal that you're looking at. So marine mammal hearing is split into a couple different weighted frequencies. And so for this, we know that baleen whales have a sensitive hearing at low frequencies, which makes them low frequency cetaceans. Narwhals, belugas, and dolphins have their sensitive hearing at a higher at high frequencies, which makes them high frequency cetaceans. And porpoises have sensitive hearing at a very high frequency, which is called very high frequency stations. Narwhals have their porous hearing at low frequencies, which is typically where we find ship noise at its highest. And as a result, the ship noise is not as loud to a narwhal as it would be for something like a bowhead whale, which has its highest sensitivity in those low frequency ranges. So what does that actually mean? When you're looking at the sound itself, um, we can look at it in terms of those perceived levels across the two of animals of interest and then the unweighted one, which means we haven't adjusted for the perceived levels. So all three graphs have their frequency, which is the sound noise level itself across the bottom. And then the sound pressure level is the y-axis, which is the amplitude of the sound. So how loud it is. So for the unweighted, which is the first graph, you can see that the sound is relatively the same across all of the frequency ranges. For the narwhals, um, the hearing, the sound is less loud at a lower frequency than it is at a higher frequency. And then for the bowhead whales, which would be our low frequency cetaceans, the sound is approximately the same across all of the frequencies. So these black boxes are where shipping noise is most prominent. And so as you can see, when you look at unweighted, it's quite loud. And then when you look at the high frequency cetacean, which would be our narwhal, the ship noise is perceived at a lower level than it would be if we didn't apply these curves. And then the bowhead whales, it shows that they hear that same ship noise it is louder to them than it would be to a narwhal. So what is, so this is just a auditory explanation of that same weighted curve. And so this is a spectrogram. The time frame is your x-axis and then the kilohertz is along the y-axis. So the sound levels itself. The brighter the color on a spectrogram, the louder it'll be. So all of that yellow and green in the first 10 seconds of this clip is um, where the sound is at its loudest. The first 10 seconds will be a raw recording, which is means that it's not filtered. It's got nothing applied to it. It's just what the recorder, recorder took in. And then the next 10 seconds are going to be what the narwhal itself will perceive once because it's had the weighted curve adjusted onto it. So that drastic drop-off is what the narwhals are perceiving. 
um, themselves. So this study was done because there is a mine in Nunavut, Canada, that is very important for is an important exporter of iron ore, and it's there's only one port in which they can import and export the ore. There's a contractual obligation to monitor and assess the impacts of the shipping, and this would include the underwater noise on the marine mammals in the area for their short, long, and cumulative terms. This port is also only accessible in a short open water season in the late summer months due to the ice that forms. And underwater recording devices like AMARS are used to monitor the underwater sound when that shipping is occurring itself. So my question was, does shipping noise cause changes in calling rates of the narwhals in Malin Inlet? So this study site is found al along the shipping routes that go in and out of Malin Inlet in northeastern Baffinlin Island. Um, the water in the background is the shipping route itself, but this is the camp that was used for the behavioral studies that were done at the same time that the uh, vocal study was being done. And so it's it's along the or shipping route that the Baffalin Iron Mines Corporation uses. So the sound recorders were located along the shipping route, which is the black line in this map. Mlin Port is the only port where they can ship the iron ore in and out. Um, and Bruce Head is where the visual studies were done from. And I used three of the AMARs to do my um, study from. So the first one was the A location, which was directly on the shipping route. Um, the other one was C, which is in Clucto Bay, which is six kilometers off of the shipping route. And then my final one was location D, which was one kilometer off of the shipping route, and it was directly in front of the visual surveys. And this was done over two years. So for when you look at the noise levels and you compare them to hearing curves um, and you're looking at ship presence and absence, you can kind of see that there's differences between the animals. And so the sound pressure level, so the loudness of the sound is the x-axis and then whether a ship was present or not is the y-axis. And this was done at each of the three AMR locations that were looked at. So this was A, C, and D. The light blue is when there is no ships present, which would be about like background noise. And then the dark blue is when there were ships present. The important thing about these graphs is that when you compare the linear ones, which would be the unweighted ones, you can see that there's a difference between the loudness of the sound when a ship is around and when it's not. And that that's also true for a low frequency cetacean like a bowhead whale, where it's noticeable when the ship is present or not, how loud that sound actually is. But when you apply the hearing curve for the narwhals, there's no statistical perceptional difference in that sound when there's a ship present versus when a ship is absent. And this was true for both ears, for the unweighted, and the bowhead whales. Another way to think about this is to look at the ship as it's going along its shipping route. And so we did this at two different AMR locations and one of them was A and one of them was C. And that's because A is directly on that shipping route and C is six kilometers into the bay itself. So it should be a quieter area for the narwhals. When a ship's northbound, it means that it's leaving the port. And when a ship is southbound, it means it's going into the port. Um, so if we look at the unweighted ones, we can see that at location A, when a ship comes by the headland and is traversing across the AMR, 
that you can hear it for quite some distance. Um, we know that this is 30 kilometers because of the study that was done. And so you can see that the green shows that it is loud. And then as it gets closer to the AMR, it becomes a bright yellow, which means it's even louder when it's crossing over the AMR. And then the same can be true when it's leaving the port. It becomes green as it approaches the AMR, really loud when it goes over it. And then you can hear it until it goes past that headland at Bruce Head. And when you're looking at them from six kilometers off of the route, the ship is still loud, but not quite as loud as when it's over the A location. And so it mostly gets loud as it's going across the mouth of the bay. And that's what the recorder that's in the bay picks up is what's actually going across the mouth of the bay itself. And then when you add on the high frequency cetacean curve, you notice that the when the ship comes in, the sound is only really loud at the A location when it's over the AMR itself. And the same is true whenever it's leaving the mine is that it it stays relatively quiet until it's over the AMR itself and then it goes back to being quiet. And for that six kilometers off where C is, it stays quiet for the whole trip, whether it's passing in front of that mouth or not, it stays uh, quiet in terms of what the narwhal are actually hearing. So in order to determine vocal changes, you have to know what call types you're kind of looking for. Um, and you need to know how those vocalization rates change in the presence of the ships. And so as part of my master's, I identified and classified calls that were recorded and attached to the narwhals based on AccuSounds and autonomous AMR recorders. And I determined that there was three main social call types that were of interest for us for this study. And so the AccuSounds are these little recorders at the end of this white arrow that are attached to the narwhals along their dorsal ridge. So just along their back where you would normally have a fin on like a bottlenose dolphin. And so the acusounds are attached there and they're set to release after a period of time, which in this case was anywhere from 12 hours to three days, depending on the recorder itself. And the other type of recorder used was AMARs. And so these are autonomous multi-channel acoustic recorders. And the ones used in this study are the AMAR G3s. And so this allows for you to station them underwater and have passive acoustic monitoring going 24 hours a day for months on end. I analyzed the four 14 minute recordings per hour that were done on here. And so an AMAR is anchored to the ground with a concrete block, and then it's attached with an acoustic release, which is this piece. And then they set it, they acoustically release it whenever they want them to come back up to the surface. And in this case, they were underwater for two months before they came up. So the three call types that I used for my study were knocks, whistles, and buzzes. And so these are just more spectrograms with the times along the bottoms and the frequency of the sound on the y-axis. And so knocks are single pulse sounds with, primary low, with primarily low frequencies and harmonics and have very short durations. And in the spectrogram, it's this very bright red straight line. And this is what it sounds like. Whistles are single tonal calls of short durations and they can range from one kilohertz to 20 kilohertz range. And most of the ones that I found are from two to seven kilohertz. And it's the squiggly line that's on this spectrogram. And this is what it sounds like. And the last one that I looked at was buzzes, and these are single element pulse sounds given in a rapid series that range anywhere from three, 300 hertz to 21.1 kilohertz. And so it's this part of the spectrogram. That's this square looking sound. And this is what it sounds like. And just, just so now that you all know what you're listening to, we'll go listen to them one more time. So this is a knock. 
and this is a whistle, and this is a buzz. When I did my study, I used a JASCO call detector in order to determine what the call counts were. And I did this instead of manually validating the data because it allowed for more of the data to be used because there was 70,000 hours of data to go through otherwise. Um, and so this allowed me to have, to know exactly what was on there without having to manually validate everything. But I also know that it was, the detectors were accurate because um, they were randomly sampled and they were validated and they had high precision but lower recalls. And so what this means is that I had low false positive rates, but high. So I knew everything that was account, everything that they said was a narwhal was 100% a narwhal, but it didn't count for 100% of the calls that were made by the narwhals themselves. So for the JASCO broadband sound levels that we got from the AMARs, I only used the recordings that were greater than 100 decibels relative to one micropascal HFC. And this is because there was only 20 files that were above 110. Um, so it wasn't going to give me an accurate representation of what the narwhal were doing when the sounds were that high. I also used recordings that had at least one narwhal call. And I did this because it ensured that I knew a narwhal was in the area. And I wasn't just looking at files with nothing in it, not knowing whether there was a narwhal or not. And this is because... 60% of the data had no narwhals in it whatsoever. I also used a general linear mix model to determine if there was changes in calling rates that occurred. And we noticed that the ambient noise levels were eight decibels higher in 2019 than they were in 2018. And we assume this is likely due to weather phenomena that was happening that year. So in order to determine the call counts versus the ship locations, I had to come up with four categories. And so I have the before, which is when it's approaching, when a ship is approaching that AMR from 30 to five kilometers. During is when it's passing directly over, um, which would be within line of, line of sight, which is plus or minus five kilometers of that AMR. And after is when it's leaving the AMR from five to 30 kilometers. And I compared those against the no-ship times, which is 60 minutes after the last sighting to 60 minutes before the next sighting of a ship. And this was to give me a baseline to allow for changes in presence and absence of calls to actually be detected and compared to. For my back, the background noise levels were higher in 2019 than they were in 2018. And this meant that ship noise had to be a lot higher in 2019 in order to be detectable by the narwhals. Before we look at some results, um, I'm just gonna remind everybody of where the recorders were actually located. So um, the AMRA is right on that shipping route. AMRC is six kilometers into Cleft Two Bay. And then AMRD is one kilometer off beside Bruce Head which is where the visual surveys were done. So the ship mean noise levels, when you compare them to when there was no ships around, there's only three times where they were statistically significant. Um, and this is while a ship was going over, directly over top of the AMRs in that plus or minus five kilometers of line of sight. And this was at 18A, 18D, and 19A. And then when we looked at the call counts at, at the two years, the two, two of the locations that were most prominent, which was A, because it's on the shipping route, and C, because it's in that bay where it would be quieter. Um, there is a change in call counts that occur while a ship is going by, but those calls come back up after the ship goes by. And so if we look at the whistles at 18A, 
we can see that in the before that there's like when you compare the before to the during you can see that the call counts go down and that they'll come back up during the after and they're relatively close to the no ship counts themselves and the same can be said for the buzzes at 18a they start out at a number then they go down and they come back up and those are pretty comparable to the no ships and it's the same for the knocks they they go down during the drink category, they come back up, and they're relatively comparable to the no-ship times. In Cleptu Bay itself, um, it's a lot less noticeable with the whistles, but they do go down and come back. And then the same can be said for the buzzes, where they'll go down while the ship is passing by that mouth of the bay and then come back up. And the same for the knocks, where they start out high, they'll go down while the ship's going by, and then they bounce back up. And if you've never looked at a violin plot before, um, the width of the shape itself is um, where the calls are, is like the distribution of the calls. So the wider the shape, the more calls are in that number category. In 2019, it was a lot less noticeable because the background noise was higher. And so you can see a small change between the before and during at the whistle counts at 19A and at, for the bus counts at location A. Um, but then when you go to the not counts, there is no real difference between them at any of the categories. And that's true for both of those locations. And then at C, um, the the calling rates didn't vary as much as they did in the previous year. When you're looking at just the during and the no ship call counts, which would be when you're seeing the changes of the ship going by, um, for the most part, all of the calls decreased when the ships were going down. There's only three instances where there was no change, and that was at 18C for the whistles and the knocks and 18D for the whistles. And then there was actually two instances where we saw the call counts go up while a ship was going by. And so that was at 19C with the buzzes and 19D with the whistles. So what does that all mean? It means that lower calling rates when the ships are within that line of sight. Um, the Sorry, the narwhal lower their calling rates when ships are within that line of sight and the ship noise levels are just detectable by them. We also, it's also found that higher noise levels did not result in a greater reduction in those call counts. And I didn't find any ship noise level threshold beyond the mere detection of the sound that caused the narwhals to change their vocal behaviors. And I found an absence of habituation because the calls returned to normal after their disturbances and I didn't find any differences between my ears. One of the limits of this study is that I only use broadband levels up to 110 decibels, but I, there was, I didn't, there was never a reason to look over that decibel threshold because calling changes did occur below it. Um, but this also means that I didn't look at high, higher amplitude sounds from ships and only the lower ones. And the ship noise levels were anywhere from zero to 35 decibels above the background noise level, so they weren't very loud in terms of the study. So in the future, there's some mitigation, mitigation strategies that would be good to keep consider for this area. And that would be to keep those ship speeds reduced to around nine knots and to limit the number of ore carriers allowed in and out per day. And if it was possible to have them leaving or entering close together, because although there would be, it would, there would be several ships going by, it would reduce the overall noise exposure that the narwhals are having per day. And to ban any ships 
uh, big ships from going into Clef du Bay. And this would be especially true for tourists, boats, and cruise ships because Clef du Bay is a known nursing ground for the narwhal. And so to keep that as a quiet refuge for them to be able to escape the shipping noise. So this study was done in partnership with uh, Bathalyn Ironmore, uh, Iron Mine, and the Jasco and Golder supplied all of the sound recordings and data for the study. And that's all. Well, thank you very much, Crystal, for a um, very interesting, uh, well-designed um, study and uh, nice, present, clear presentation. Um, at the moment, I don't see any uh, questions in the Q&A, so let me uh, ask you a couple of questions here. Um, so does, does the speed of the ship affect um, the intensity of the ship noise, so would having speed limitations, um, for example, reduce the level of ship noise? So the higher speeds that the, the boats go by, the louder the noise actually is. There is a speed reduction in this area, so that's at nine knots. None of the boats can go over that as of right now. Um, but yes, when boats travel at faster speeds, there is more louder noise happening. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I do see a uh, question there now. So, Sophia, are you handling questions? Happy to read it out. So Deborah is asking, you mentioned that AccuSounds were used as well as the AMARS but it looks like the results were mostly from the AMARS. How were the AccuSounds used or not used? So the AccuSounds were used more in my master, in the first part of my master's study, and they were used to determine the call, like the, I used them to build like a call repertoire to determine what call calls narwhals actually made and what frequency ranges they occurred at and the durations of the calls because they were on the animals themselves it gave me the most accurate representation of the calls that the narwhals were making perfect thank you and there's another question here hi crystal can you tell us to what extent the detector classifier could be impacted by the speed noise itself and hence its performance degrade in the presence of the ship noise contributing to some of the difference So I guess, are you asking if the speed, the extent that detector class for could be impacted by the speed noise? So if, if the ship was really loud, like how the detector itself would would fair is that is that what the question is? I think <laughs> more noise you can miss. Oh yeah, so um yeah, if when the ships were over the AMARs where they would have been really loud, they would have been likely that they could miss some calls, um because it's there's only so much that the detector can account for, um, but there were calls detected while the ships were going by. And I did, I did, like, when it said there were ships going by and there were normal calls, I did go in and manually validate that that was occurring to make sure that the detector was working properly. Um, but it is a detector, so it's not going to catch everything, but it did detect calls as the ships were going by. Perfect. Well done. If you have any more questions, feel free to use the Q&A section. There's one coming in now. 
um, some coal types were affected at different sites, such as buzzes decreased, but whistles remained the same during ships passing. What are some reasons for this, do you think? <laughs> um, I feel like, I guess that this is just speculation. I don't really have a, like scientific proof of it, but I would think that some of them decreased while others didn't based on what they were doing while they were passing by those AMARs. Um, because like Clutchy Bay is where they go and like nurse and calf and I don't want to say hang out, but like hang out, like they just, they kind of are in that area and then they'll come out of the bay to forage. And so um, that might change what type of calls that they're making as they're going by those AMARs, if they change what type of calls they're making, depending on what they're doing. Lovely, thank you. And there's another question here. At what depth were the AMARs? In other words, what was the distance between the AMAR and the ship passing straight overhead? 200 meters. 200 meters. Perfect, thank you. So I'll ask another question uh, while we're waiting to see if there are more. So um, were there other vessels besides these ships going to and from the mine? And um, uh, how does that uh, impact uh, your results? I mean, where, how were they controlled for? Um, so there were other ships in the area because there's um, hunting boats and tourist vessels and cruise ships. And at the beginning of the season, there's icebreakers that go by. Um, I specifically pulled out transits that only had one ore carrier going in and out. And um, the, that's in the no ship times, there was like no ship was detected for an hour before or after. So it was like there was no ship in the area for at least an hour for it to be considered that no ship. Um, but there were other, there were definitely other ships and I tried to control for it as much as I could by only using like the ore carriers and times when I knew for sure there was no ship in the area. Thank you. I myself had a silly question and that was whether you listen to any novel calls to relax and meditate. <laughs> But there was a question come in the chat that might be relevant because someone's asking if you're open to sharing some of the recordings and if someone can contact you um, to share the audio recordings of the novels. Yeah. Perfect. I'd say um, probably give your best contact information if it's your email address or the paper is available open access. So there should be some contact information on there too. Yeah, the on the on the paper, um, it has Jack listed as the contact address, but me and Jack talk all the time, so it's okay to send it to him, and he'll send it to me. So I have a question, um, because I'm not in the acoustics; it's not my area. You're talking about right this understanding of the narwhals and the whale species having these different frequencies at which they hear at. How are those? sound curves and those corrections actually established? Is that using like micro cues and you're actually looking at the structures of the ear to determine that? Or is that other studies that have determined like where are those frequencies that they're hearing at? Like how do you actually determine that? Um, they're done with behavioral studies in a, lab. in a lab. Okay. And so for the narwhal, um, they're cousins of like blue, I guess they're I don't know if they're actually cousins, cousins, but they're cousins of belugas. And so because we can study belugas in the lab, we know, or they have done studies of belugas in labs, they know what their hearing capabilities are. And then, so that would also apply to the narwhal. And that's why we know what that hearing range is for high frequency stations. 
cool. Um, Tanya or Tanja to follow up. So if you do that, they're asking about getting the contact address. I'm looking Sophia might be typing an answer, but I'll say you can follow the link that I posted in the chat to the open access paper. And from there, there will be contact information for John, who is Crystal's advisor on this project, and he's the contact person, and you can reach out to him. So do we have any other questions from either the listening audience or Sophia? I mean, I was wondering early on when you showed the, the difference between the narwhal frequencies and the baleen whales, was that compared from the same recordings? Was Were those plots from a different study but comparing the two species? Nope, they were all done using the same uh, recordings that I used. So I had a, a, someone else was doing his master's at the same time as me, so we used all the same data for all of that, and that's from his study. So he used the same AMI recorders that I used in mine to do his plots. Cool, thanks. So are there baleen whales that are being affected as well? And will we see a paper out um, focused on the baleen whales? I don't think that they... Nothing beyond the, the noise level study. Yeah. Um, the Sam Sweeney's paper is the one that did a noise level study on it. And whatever, there, as far as we know, there's nothing beyond what that paper did that they're doing work on for the for the bowhead whales, because that's the baleen whales in the area. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions popping up. Um, no, one maybe just did. So let's go ahead and take that one. I can go ahead and read this one. Um, Deborah asks, were you able to look at Lombard effects, i.e. did narwhal shift the call durations, call amplitudes, frequency range, etc., in response to the noise, the ship noise? We can't cal calculate the amplitude of the calls because you don't know where the narwhals are at the distance. They're not possible to study. Was Jack's response actually <laughs> hearable to anybody? <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. Cool. Um, I'll go ahead and ask a question that I had mentioned before. So we're the student members at large, part of the sort of student organization helping to support students in Society for Endomology. And so we always like to ask, especially when we have successful students that have clearly done really cool research and put out publications, um, if you have any general advice people who are looking to getting into the study area or marine mammal research more broadly, things that you've learned through your process? I would say that making connections is very important <laughs> for uh, getting in and being able to do studies and things that like, yeah, making those, making those connections and reaching out to people um, can go a lot farther than you think it can. I might sense. have a student question as well. Um, yeah. How did you find the transition from doing graduate research to trying to publish that in a paper? Because that's something our students have to kind of learn from scratch that is really yeah. tricky to navigate. So how did you find that process? Um, I feel like I had a really good supervisor <laughs> that also helped out a lot. But it's definitely different because when you're writing like when you're writing your master's, you're just putting so much information into everything and you're just like explaining everything in so much detail. And then you basically have to trim it down to be able to get it in a publishable format to be able to, um, so it's not like, so you weren't reading like 80 pages of my master's, right? And so, um, yeah. It's, it's my baby and it was it was a lot to be able to like trim it down, but you just sometimes have to be like, this needs to be cut because it's not 
it's not the core information that you're trying to portray. And sometimes that's a little bit more difficult than I think people realize going into it. No, well done. You clearly captured some interest with it. That's why we're here. So good job. Thanks. Yeah, and interestingly, reviewers are pretty good at um, picking out things that are excessive and they can often tell when it's a student, um, even though there may be, um, you know, your advisor as a co-author and so forth, there, it's a whole lot easier for someone not involved in a project um, or writing the paper to kind of read it and say, mm, I think you could be more concise and this could go or that could go. So um, you, you probably will find that you get help from reviewers in that regard as well. Yeah, that I would I would agree with that. That the the reviewers were definitely good at catching some of that stuff that we would have missed. Well, not seeing any further questions, I think uh, we'll go ahead and thank you for an excellent presentation, for a nice paper, and for a very nice um, uh, talk. And on that, we'll call it an end to uh, the session. So thank you again, Crystal. Um, Jack, good to talk to you um, before the seminar. And uh, um, we'll, we'll look forward to some further papers in marine mammal science. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, stay tuned for um, hopefully another seminar next month. OK, bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Daryl. Yes, in January, yep. we have a talk about um, tidal lung volume in gray whales that we have scheduled. So third week of thir Thursday in January, we'll be back and we'll send out all that information. And a reminder as well that Crystal's paper is open access and you can find this recording um, if you talk to anyone about it and they missed it either on the Society for Marine Mammalogy Facebook page or on our YouTube channel as well. The recording will be available there um, within a couple days, in a couple weeks, give or take. Excellent. Thank you, Teresa. All right. Good night. Good day. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye.